seen a lot of changes. You can't believe how much the school has grown. When I was here, the performance center was just being built. And uh, some of you might remember uh, the Zildjian Day in Boston we did here about four or five years ago. And I think that was the, the last time I was in the performance center. It was then. It's a great place to play and be. And um, you know, I think I, I may have walked through the hallway of the school maybe once or twice, maybe, you know, in nine years or ten years or however long it's been since I left Boston. And uh, it's quite remarkable to see all the changes and everything that's been going on here. And um, I sent for a catalog not too long ago <laughs> just to see what was happening. That, I was missing out on since I left the school. And it's really hard to believe all the things that you can learn here. And um, I think it's really wonderful to be able to, to take courses in producing and all the things that are necessary to, um, to function in today's modern music, musical society. And, uh, I only wish that uh, when I was here, some of those things were more available to me. Um, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that this guy has gone. Fantastic. Um, if there's anything, like I said, that you want to ask me, please feel free to do so. Yes, so whether it's a, a real modulation or if it's what I call the superimposed modulation. Like if I was playing, just like an example, like... Um, you know, I was just playing, and, and all of a sudden, I just, let's say I was going to have a, um, a dot eighth note, get, get the modulation, you know, that it to the other 
thing. So it just kind of sounds like, you know, the, the time just shifts and goes into another time thing when, when the pulse is always there, you know. So I always try to relate it to that. And, uh, you know, in that case, it, that's, that's really like a big four over three, you know. resolves in three beats, it's, but, you know, uh, so it just depends, you know, I think yes. Question, I saw you doing a song at one time, and it, what it appeared to be, that your left hand was sustaining, like, eighth notes, da, 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 da. The samba? Yeah. And the oh, yeah. Okay. Well, it, it, I didn't do it, you know. Kind of like the left hand equivalent of this thing, you know. So I kind of like, see? Fingers and wrists. Pardon? Fingers and wrists. Kind of, you know. Like a lot of times I flam the high hand in the snare. 
And then it makes the beat seem a little wider. Yeah. And um, I think creative use of flams like that can help you just add a little more dimension to your time playing. Yes? Uh, my approach in playing by myself or playing on the road with like somebody like Lee, well, it depends on who I'm playing with and as opposed to playing by myself. Like with Lee, I already know what kind of limitations I'm going to have and how much liberty I can take with the music, you know. But the basic difference between, for me, playing by myself and behind and playing with a band is, is that when I play by myself, I have nothing to react to. So the possibilities are that either I'm going to feel extremely creative and just play whatever I want, and that, and that at the moment I sit down behind the drum set, I'm just going to spew all of this creative, you know, juices are going to come out, you know, or, or else I'm going to sit down and nothing's going to come out, like today, you see. So it's like I sat down behind the drum set and I just kind of looked at him and I said, well, what am I going to do? Who am I going to play? You know, it's like I'm real funny that way. I need like a lot of time to warm up and, and if I get, if my head shifts in a funny direction, I bl I'll blank out, you know. So, or else I just might anything can happen. I can feel real good and I'll just, yeah, you know, and I'm glad that I'm playing by myself because I can just blow, you know. Whereas with a band, it's like, the things there is, is that you always are going to have somebody to react off of. So, you know, you, you got three or four guys, somebody's going to have a creative idea and it'll feed you in some way, you know. You know what I'm saying? So, so it's like, it's really hard to play by yourself because either you're going to play your large vocabulary of stuff, and you have to tell yourself, well, I'm playing in a different town tonight, so even though I'm playing the same old stuff, maybe they won't know it. Until you go back to the town again, you know, then you better have a whole blue bag of things, you know. And, or else, you just create it and, you know. So that's, that's really what it is. And, and, you know, at least, I mean, I try to, I feel like I'm fulfilling some kind of musical purpose when I'm playing with people, you know. It's like, like I'm doing it for a reason, other than just to, show people what I can or can't do on a drum set, you know, which, which varies from day to day, you know, I mean, because, I mean, no matter what my acquired capacity on a drum set is, it's like one day I'm like knocking myself out, and the other day I feel like shooting myself, you know, so at least with, with music, I can play music, you know, so that's the big difference for me, you know, and, and here I have to find it from within, you know, it's, it's weird. Yes? What I do when I'm playing and I feel like it's just not right for me is in a, in a band situation I've found that this, that's kind of, I can get by it because I can get over it when I'm playing with musicians because I know that my acquired capacity is good enough that, that if I don't feel on, I can at least make the gig good, you know. And I can kind of go on autopilot and I know how to play well enough so that I can accompany well enough to, to make the music sound good and I can still react, because I'm so sensitive that I can react, I mean as a human being I'm a very sensitive person, you know, I, I'm easily hurt, my feelings are easily hurt, and you know, I'm real funny that way, so I react to music easily, you know, and, and if I feel like I'm in a personal rut, I just try to let myself go and go, okay, listen, I, I may not be having my best day, but I at least I'm playing the gig and everything's going okay and the music is still going to sound good. It's going to be okay. Whereas if it's just for me, yeah, you know, so, so that's the, because that's the most important thing. But the most important thing is to, to play the music, not just for yourself, you know. Make the music sound good because that's what the people want to hear, you know. But for you, for me, like now, I just, I, all I can do is just do the best that I can do, you know. And uh, just say, okay, this is it. You know, I, I mean, you have to accept it. As, uh, I either have to live with it or just not play. You know, so the choice is already made. I'm, I'm up here, and I have to play. I have to play for you. You see, so I have no choice. <laughs> um, could you excuse me for one moment while I change my T-shirt? Because I am uh, just kind of getting over a cold or a sore throat. 
I'm a little chilly up here, so I'm going to step backstage and I'll be back in like 10 seconds. <laughs> I mean, if I just sit, sat here and played these, I mean, like, like a, a soft little groove like that, it really wouldn't make sense. Sensitivities, but you know, it's like the whole point in doing that is is you're going to hit a cymbal soft with no bass drum because of some musical event that you're trying to reinforce. And in this case, there is nothing happening right now. You know, so I mean. It's hard to kind of make sense out of that. You see what I'm trying to say? Unless you can just kind of look at it and go, oh, that sounds nice, you know? You know, I didn't sit here and go, you know, I just, and, and you have to look at it like, why is he playing the hi-hat like that? You know? Well, it's less abrasive, so it sounds more like a shaker. that are no different than what anyone else would play because of the musical thing of it. Um, okay, how about I keep a groove like Keep It Greasy going? Um, okay, what, what I did was I familiarized myself with, with playing, with what I needed to play when, I, when we played the tune. We were playing it on the road live, and when we cut the track in the studio, it was all hand signals. Like on a queue, we went into this 1916 thing, and on another queue, we went into the 21, and on another queue, we did something else, you know, and, um, 
I just, I, I, I got to be honest with you. I just went for it, you know. I, that's all, all I did was, I swear to God, I just, I just went for it, you know. And I figured, well, you know. And, you know, I didn't have an audience or nothing. Even, even though it didn't occur to me at the time that it was going to be documented and God knows how many people are going to hear it. It just figured we're in a studio. If we make a mistake, we'll stop, you know. No big thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, we didn't, though. We just kept playing. And, and... We're here. Did uh, you and Steve Smith just practice together? Oh, yeah. How did you, like, practice together and push each other? Well, um, Smith and I, we used to practice all the time together. And, um... You know, I'd go to, over to his house and we'd be out in his shed in the back and we'd just like playing our ride cymbal as fast as we could all night long until somebody fell asleep and listen to McCoy Tyner records and listen to Tony and we would just like listen to the records and just get off on what was happening, you know, you know, and just hear the guys playing if Tony did something, you know, like, just one thing that killed us, you know. In 20 bars, we would just like die, and then we'd turn the thing back and listen to it over and over, and do things like that. Or listen to the guys like Billy play, you know, all those up tempo blues. Just we would we would go nuts, so we just kind of tore it apart and listened to all our favorite things and played together, and just it was great to have a friend like that that I could share things with. And Steve has always been my, my good drum buddy. And we used to take, we took lessons from Gary together. I mean, we were at the same time. We decided that we wanted to take group lessons. So we even went that far, so that we teamed up together and we went and saw Gary at the same time, so the three of us would be sitting in there, you know, and we had these group lessons, and Steve and I went. It was fun. It's a lot of fun. Yes? What made you decide to leave Berkeley? Um, I, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon? What made you decide to leave Berkeley? Um, the reason I left Berkeley was because I ran out of money. <laughs> 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 Simple as that. And I, I really, I wanted to, to go out and get a gig because I, I come from kind of a scattered home situation. And I'm really kind of a nomad in a lot of ways. And um, so, you know, I didn't have any money and I couldn't put myself through school. My, my parents couldn't put me through school, unfortunately. And I changed from instrumental performance to composition in the second semester. And I wanted to keep going just to write, to learn how to write more. That's really what I wanted. Because I was playing and just being in the environment of the school was, you know, I had all the playing I could ask for because there were so many wonderful musicians around, teachers and, and players and students. It was just a great atmosphere to be in. So I really wanted to get more writing and, and I couldn't, so I had to leave. Yes? Yeah, uh, I, I went to LA after I left school. I went to LA and I, I was just kind of struggling around for four months. And then um, I was playing with Tom Fowler. And Tom Fowler was the bass player and he used to play with Frank. He played on the Roxy and Elsewhere record. And him and his brothers. And he, George Duke called him up and told him that Frank was looking for a, a rhythm section. So he told me that and I called the office up and pestered him and told him I'd send him a tape and they didn't want a tape for me. But one day they just called me up and said, okay, well, come down here and Mr. Zappa will listen to you on Wednesday night. So I showed up at this place called Culver City Studio. It was a huge movie studio. You know, like, like a, one of those, you know those huge sound stages they have at the studios? I don't know if you've ever been to those tours, but in Hollywood they have a ton of them, you know? And uh, so I went there and just, I, I said, oh man, you know, there was like all these drummers and I just went for it. I shot my shot, you know, like, this is it. Do or die for me, think or swim, here I go. And Joe's Garage, wait one second, Joe's Garage happened as an accident. We went in to cut one single, one tune, and we were in there for a month. In fact, there was a group called Group 87 that I was supposed to go up north and record with at the time. And, uh, you know, Mark Isham and Patrick O'Hearn and those guys. And O'Hearn was calling me up saying, can we, you know, go up and do this record? I said, well, I'm still in here with Frank, you know. I was still in here, you know, so, so Bozio ended up doing it, and Bozio and O'Hearn were cronies from Frank's days anyway, so it was good that they hooked up, you know, and they were used to playing together, and, and uh, it, it worked out really great for them, and it worked out great for me, because I, you know, got to do the Joe's Garage thing. Okay, we got about five minutes here. When you uh, said that you and Gary started together, I mean, uh, you and C said together with Gary, what kind of stuff did you work on? I can't, I'm, I go to him now, I can't really imagine having two people in there. What kind of stuff did you make you guys do? Uh, with Gary? Yeah. Well, you know, what we did was, 
Gary looked at us and approached us as individuals for what we were, and he, he knew the kind of stuff he worked on was, it's hard to describe, it's like Gary, Gary knew that we understood where he was coming from, so he wasn't afraid to take liberties with us, and he could see our styles of playing, and he could see that Steve and I were assimilating information together, and we were converging this information between us, and we worked on things that, see, the stuff that is in his kind of curriculum, or his method now, was, was just being formed then. So we were also springboards for him. So we just kind of tossed information around. I mean, we would just go in, go in and Gary would put on a Tony Williams record. And just would listen. And then we'd take it from there, you see. Or he'd just have someone written down and we'd just take something. And just, okay, where are we going to go with this now, you know? Or, or he, would, he would just like, you know, lay stuff on us and, you know, anything could happen. Really, so so it, it was a very open-ended kind of give and take situation in our lessons, and it was it was really really um, created that way. It was very creative. It wasn't cut and dry. It was real creative. I, it was, I loved it. <clears throat> yes, unfortunately, Steve and I can't record it in time because our schedules um, were, were too busy. So. Uh, the, good, the great thing is that Gary and Jonathan Luber are going to record it, and I think it's going to be in some kind of a sound sheet. I don't know. There, there's a chance that that could happen. So we'll see. Um, but, you know, it should be documented in some way. And I would love to see Gary do it and perform it, because I think he needs to be heard more anyway by the public. Um, I, I'm going to try... Um, I hope this tape works. I haven't done any sound check at all, but, but I, I have something here that I'm going to try to just play along with. And um, uh, I don't know how to work this thing. <laughs> oh, eject, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, is this thing on? You didn't get on to it. Okay, I don't think I have it in the monitor. So, can you give it to me? One little last thing, and then, uh, well, we're going to have to call it quits. So, um, hey, thanks for bearing with me. And uh, I, I want to say one thing uh, real quick uh, before, before I play, because we've really got to get uh, kind of short here. Um, I'm really grateful for all of you for um, for appreciating me for what you saw today because I really felt insecure when I walked on the stage, and I just finished a, t a series of t a clinic tour, uh, two weeks in Europe, and I had some good nights and I had some bad nights, you know. But overall, I felt pretty good, you know. I felt like my chops felt good and. Uh, and today it was really hard for me, you know, because I went to school here and, um, you know, just to get up here without sufficient warm up and kind of make mistakes and having you people appreciate me for what I am, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And, uh, and I'm really, really appreciate that you, you, you can look at that and get something out of it, you know. So um, I, I really hope that I could provide some insights to you and some, some entertainment as well, you know, in some way. Yeah. Best. I'm not trying to make excuses. I really mean that. Um, um, you are the best. Uh, yeah. 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 Woo. And, um, also, um, I'd like to thank my wife, Darlene. She's sitting up in the balcony. And I'm really, I don't want to give some kind of, you know, speech. <laughs> Here he goes now. To the little thing he broke down in the dressing room before. <laughs> I really mean this. Um, I sincerely mean it. Um, for for being such a great human being because she really has to put up with a lot with me, let me tell you. Uh, I'm not the easiest person to get along with, you know. Um, I'm kind of moody, you know, and temperamental and insecure and all that. Um, and I, I, I appreciate it very much, you know. 
And um, also, uh, you know, to the Berkeley College of Music uh, for being probably the best institution of its kind, you know, I'm sure. And, um, and I, I certainly learned a lot while I was here, and I'm really glad to see that it's continuing in the tradition. And I really wanted to, to tell everybody, uh, I, I want to extend my sincere appreciation to the Avita Zildjian Simple Company. And I think that all businesses and all people should take a lesson from the Zildjian Simple Company as human beings and as businessmen, because um, it would be enough if they only made the best symbols in the world. It would be enough. But they don't stop, because I've, I've been associated with them for several years now, and I've got to tell you that they're the best people that I've ever dealt with, and they really recognize human beings for what they are, and they're real, real warm human beings, and I really think that Everybody should take a lesson from that because they're incredible people and Armin and his wife and Lenny, Demisio and Carlin and to Zildjian International over in England um, are some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life and some of the warmest human beings and I want to extend all my love and gratitude to them sincerely because they really are the best and, um, and I think they set an example for everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you all very much for your kindness, and uh, I hope this tape works, so I'm going to try to play one little tune for you here.
very kind of you. I don't deserve it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, did you hear music? Oh, great. People attempt at trying to impersonate your career. Yes. Thanks a lot, you guys. I really appreciate it. Hey, listen, uh, can we give a big round of applause to Lenny DiMuzio today? Because it's his birthday. Uh, I want to say happy birthday, he is. Happy birthday to him. Take care and have a nice day. Thanks so much for attending. Thank you.